So looking at Raw this week, to me, it really felt like a show where not a lot was actually accomplished, and frankly, not a lot really went on. So much was encapsulated in one story, uh, and really almost, you would say, just one character, that the rest of the show just kind of felt like filler. And some of the stuff that did actually occur on the show that was an attempt to have some substance seemed to really miss the mark to me. And it really was. This show was about Roman Reigns and Roman Reigns specifically with a little Dean Ambrose mixed in. And that was really, frankly, the only thing that honestly mattered on the show. A lot of this felt like other stuff we've seen and so on and so forth. I know we've seen some reports about how WWE's creative team likes the fact that there's a big show every couple of weeks, or they like that at least, because in part it allows them to turn around stories quicker, it's easier for them to book, they don't have to worry about stretching stuff out. I, on the other hand, think that's incredibly lazy talk from them. I think that's incredibly foolish. Now, granted, I'm not the one working underneath Vincent K. McMahon, and I don't have to deal with Vincent K. McMahon and his propensity to want to change his mind, so I can only imagine how difficult it is to try and stretch out a story when you have a guy that's trying to hot shot everything for the benefit of now and fuck the later. I get that and I understand that. But my thing is, is it's kind of getting hard here. You've got payback. Then you've got elimination chamber. Then a couple of weeks later, you've got money in the bank. You know, it, it starts to get a little old in the sense that you're trying to get ramped up for something every two weeks. And eventually, if the WWE continues on this path, and I'm not saying they're going to, but if they do, they're going to start running into some problems, in my opinion, because they're going to be hot-shotting so many things and rushing through so many things that they're going to turn through stories, ideas, angles, and characters even quickly, even more quickly than they already do. And that is going to create some real problems for their product. Now, looking at what happened with this show outside of Roman and his big night, if you will, like I said, again, it was, for the most part, forgettable. It didn't really accomplish much. I look at Ryback, your new Intercontinental Champion, and they've got him set off to face off with The Miz, and then out comes Big Show. And you could see it coming where he was going to knock out The Miz, and... I guess my whole thing is, is if you were going to have Ryback win the IC title just to feud with Big Show, I probably would take a pass on that. I, I understand, you know, a lot of you look at a guy like Ryback and don't envision him as an ideal intercontinental champion, and I understand that to a degree. However, I think it works more appropriately when you have a heel like Seth Rollins and the style of Seth Rollins as your world champion. Having more of that muscle guy, that less traditional worker, if you will, as the IC champion, I think does make some sense, and I think it can work. Provide some contrast of champions on the card. Similar to what happened with Hogan back in the day, you would have Hogan as the champion, but you would have somebody like a macho man as the IC champion or a Mr. Perfect as the IC champion or the honky tonk man as an IC champion, a tif different type of guy holding that second level belt that made it almost feel like a first level belt. Um, but Ryback and Big Show, I have absolutely no interest in seeing. I, I just don't. You know, if this is what they were going to do when they gave the belt to Ryback, I'd almost say no thank you, but we'll, we'll see what they do there. Now, I did like what Kevin Owens did on this show. And I know a lot of people don't like what John Cena did in his promo, or at least some people don't because they feel like he was exploiting a kid and the WWE was exploiting a kid and his uh, cancer battle in order to try and get people behind Cena. And this is one of these things that people always talk about and they get frustrated with Cena. It's like on the one hand, he's doing something that's cool and that's fine, but people see the deeper lying motives here. I'll talk about this in another video. It's not the place for me to really talk about it. My thing about Cena is that, you know, while I don't feel like he made any excuses from a character's standpoint in terms of why he lost to Kevin Owens, it was just more of the same old crap. It's, it's like Cena puts a guy over, but then it goes back to the same old Cena bullshit. And what I'm hoping at Money in the Bank happens is that it isn't the same old Cena bullshit of he gets his win back and then he goes and beats Owens again and so on and so forth. This is a situation where John Cena is the top guy. John Cena ultimately has creative control over his character no matter what anybody tries to fucking tell you and spin you otherwise. John Cena is the one that will dictate how this goes and he needs to understand that Owens is hot right now. The company has some momentum behind this guy. He's moving merch. He's getting reactions. They need to go with this guy. 
that Cena is the perfect guy to put this guy on the map and stamp his place very high in the WWE hierarchy on a relatively quick basis. So I'm hoping that's not what's going to happen, is it's going to be more of the same old Cena monster bullshit come money in the bank and then after that. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. I mean, you know to me when you're talking about Raw, when I see Dolph Ziggler versus Kofi Kingston, it's similar to like a Dolph Ziggler versus Sheamus or like a Sheamus versus a Daniel Bryan. I've seen it so many damn times, I just have absolutely no interest in it. And then they go and make it a six-man tag, which makes it even less interested. I'm sure Teddy Long enjoyed it, but I did not. You've got a Divas title match. Now, let me get this straight. you got Paige finally gets her one-on-one -on -one opportunity, even though she just wrestled for the title the night before. And she's going against Nikki Bella. Instead of trying to save this for money in the bank, instead of trying to put any real story behind this, we just randomly throw the fucking match out there. And we have Nikki Bella win with twin magic. How ridiculous is this? Nikki's hair is different from Brie, and most certainly her breasts are different from Brie. You would have to look really, really closely at this point in time between Nikki and Brie Bella, really, really closely, to even see any elements of them being twins. So the fact that they would do a twin magic finish here is completely and utterly fucking ridiculous. As it's fucking ridiculous to ever have Randy Orton and Sheamus wrestle ever again. These are two guys that are good. These are two guys that are talented. These are two guys that could put on good matches. However, for whatever reason, it's just something about Randy Orton and Sheamus. They have absolutely no fucking chemistry in the ring whatsoever. It seems like every one of their matches is just a brutal fucking chore to get through. I don't necessarily blame the guys. It's sometimes that's just the way it is. I don't blame the crowd because, frankly, they don't have any reason to really get into it. They really don't want to see it. So I don't know why this company would trot out their Randy Orton versus Sheamus at any point in time, even with a different dynamic of Orton being a face and Sheamus being a heel. I don't know why. I don't know why you would go there. The people don't like it. It seems like these guys don't even really like it. It's just not necessary. <laughs> and speaking of not necessary... This whole interview they did backstage with Rusev, where you've got him on crutches. You know, they're doing the thing with Ziggler and Lana, and I, I'm really not into that. But you've got Rusev here. And what I don't understand is you've built this guy up for over a year as this monster, as this only John Cena can stop type of force. This guy has blown through a lot of people. He has dominated. And now you're going out of your way to emphasize weakness. You're going out of your way to emphasize injury. Why would you even bother doing that? Tell me, before the injury even happened, I would have entertained after what happened with Rusev in that I quit match. You do something with him and Lana immediately, and then you write Rusev off of TV, at least maybe until Money in the Bank, or perhaps even a SummerSlam. You know, go away from it a little bit. But what they're having them do, they're making them look all pathetic, and now you're sitting there and maybe teasing a potential face turn for Rusev. I'm not sure they're going to go with the face turn for Rusev, but it was really hard for me to figure out what the blue hell they were hoping to accomplish with this, other than to make the big guy look weak and vulnerable. And you shouldn't be making that big guy look weak and vulnerable. That's ridiculous because so many things you've done with this character are anything but that. And now the guy is lost and he doesn't fucking know. And who knows what's going to happen. And he's got this injury and we're emphasizing this. We're continuing to drive this point home. Do you really think at this point in time it's called for for Rusev to be booked and written into TV in this type of manner? Do you really think this is a good idea to sit there and make him look weak and frankly kind of look like a pathetic sad chump? I mean, really. If you're going to do that, at least have them continue to try and pursue Lana. You know, make that story actually work. Make that story actually something that we believe, where Lana was the one that was calling me a shots the entire time, and Rusev was just fucking pussy whipped. Rusev tried to sit there and finally stand up in some certain light, and now that Lana's gone, he's lost himself. He can't figure out himself. He can't even masturbate well at night because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, and he doesn't know how his life can go on, and he wants this bitch to take back control of his damn life and him. Now that's a story that people can buy. That's a story that people can believe. That's a story that would make sense. But we won't get that. I, like I said, I don't know what the fuck they were accomplishing with Rusev. 
You have Neville beat Bo Dallas again, and this is again when we talk about the hot shotting and stuff now that you've got a, a big show basically every two weeks. I'm not saying that's going to continue, but my, this is my concern. If it does, now instead of trying to add another layer maybe to Bo Dallas and Neville, you, you just sit there and you're having Neville go over, and then what's the whole point of it? And like I said, for the most part, for most of this show, it really was, what was the point of all of this? And then we've got Roman Reigns, and you know, I guess my thing is, is if you're afraid that the crowd isn't fully getting behind him as a baby face and you want the people to like him because you think they should like him and they do have reasons to like him, and I don't fully disagree with that, maybe we shouldn't go down the John Cena route of booking him on a ship. This is my opinion. You have him blow through Wade Barrett, or beat Wade Barrett at least, you have him go through Mark Henry, even if it's a wishy-washy finish. And then you have him beat Bray Wyatt. You know, this is part of the whole problem with Cena in terms of having trouble finding legitimate opponents, legitimate contenders for him, is because Cena has blown through so many people on the years. Now you've sat there, and in the course of one night, he's beaten Wade Barrett, somebody who could be booked to be a legitimate threat for Roman Reigns if they cared to, a Mark Henry... Somebody that could definitely work as an opponent for Roman Reigns. It would make a lot of sense. It wouldn't take a lot of effort to actually book it that way. And then Bray Wyatt, again, similar type of thing to Wade Barrett and Mark Henry. A natural opponent that would make a lot of sense. Here's the guy you just had wrestling The Undertaker at WrestleMania. And now he's sitting there and he's jobbing out on Raw to Roman Reigns. This is ridiculous. And I get part of the whole appeal of this was trying to spotlight Roman Reigns while at the same time teasing what you're doing with Dean Ambrose. And they did a good job of that. And I do really like the fact that they're going there in terms of having Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns actually be friends on screen. I do think this is not something that they fail to do on both the heel and babyface side and something that needs to be done more because eventually when those friendships crumble and fall and split apart, you've got a really nicely organically grown natural program, feud, rivalry that could cause people to be really interested. And you look at where you're going with Dean Ambrose and potentially where you've got Seth Rollins or where you could potentially go with Roman Reigns. You know, at some point in time, splitting him off and Dean Ambrose off and having them go against each other makes a world of sense because you haven't gone there yet. And when it comes from a Roman Reigns standpoint, you really haven't gone all the way there with him and Seth Rollins yet. I mean, there's a lot of potential and a lot of possibilities there. So I like that they're kind of doing this semi-bromance, if you will, with Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose because... At some point in time, potentially this summer, it could make for some really compelling television. But my thing is, is that this whole thing was just, to me, geared with one thing in mind, and that was just to telegraph that Roman Reigns is winning Money in the Bank. And what made it hard to really get into this show is the whole night. You know, even after he beats Wade Barrett, you don't really view Wade Barrett as a viable competitor. And then here comes Mark Henry. And honestly, even though it was sexual chalk with the world's strongest man, you don't really view him as legitimate competition for Roman Reigns. And then you've got Bray Wyatt. You get to that point, you know Roman Reigns isn't about to lose. At no point in time did you really feel that Roman Reigns' spot in the Money in the Bank match was at risk. What you don't understand, frankly, from the authority, and this is what sometimes makes the authority such a stupid group and such a stupid story for me on WWE television is, if they don't want Roman Reigns in the match, then why put him in there to fucking begin with? He's fucking with you. Why would you not sit there and make him earn the spot? You've already given him the spot, and now you're trying to take it away? It makes absolutely zero fucking sense. This lack of attention to details is astoundingly ridiculous. And again, you're trying to get people behind Roman Reigns. You know, and that's part of the thing that would make a heel turn work even better, is if you actually could finally get more people unanimously behind Roman Reigns, when he does turn heel, you could frankly piss a lot of people off, like you did with Seth Rollins. If some people already want to hate him, and then you turn him heel then frankly all you're doing is giving them a reason to hate him and at some point in time they're just going to like him and cheer him and then you've got the problem you have with so many other characters on your television. You know, what I would have liked more to have happened here 
was maybe you did a three-on-one handicap tag match to main event the show, and Roman Reigns is getting the shit kicked out of him, and Dean Ambrose comes out and makes the save and helps him out, and that's the only way that Roman Reigns is able to get the job done. Otherwise, just the whole night, you're sitting there waiting, and the only thing you're frankly waiting for is for Dean Ambrose to make his appearance, because you know that's the only thing that's going to help save this night. And that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. It was just a show that really didn't accomplish a whole lot, a show that really didn't get a lot done. And what it did get done, hmm. <laughs> you know, it really didn't do, I thought, what it needed to do. And it felt like, in a lot of ways, a waste of time. And that's one thing I don't want to feel like when I watch three hours of Raw, is feel like I'm wasting my time. And I did. You know, that's why I'm glad I sat there and watched, continued to watch Texas Rising on Monday night and waited till Tuesday morning to watch Raw. Because then if there's something I really don't want to see, I have the ability to just skip through it. Or if I got something I want to watch again, I can go back to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, you guys can feel free to let me know what you thought of Raw this week. But I don't know about you. I just had trouble buying into the whole notion that Roman Reigns was ever in any real jeopardy or trouble of losing his money in the bank spot. And that is something that's very reminiscent to me of how they would book a Cena. They give you all these bullshit obstacles where they're really not bullshit obstacles because in large part, John Cena is the obstacle. And you feel like at the end of the show, that's it. And I just had three hours of my life wasted. That's what this week's Raw was to me.